thank you all for attending this talk today. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the Indian civilization and provocatively I have a title that there is an untold story there. And I hope as I progress through the talk it will become clear that there is indeed something like that. Before I start, Indian History Awareness and Research, this is loosely a think tank of, uh, 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 of, of professionals who are based in Houston, in Singapore, in Bangalore, as well as in Columbus, Ohio. So I will uh, start off my talk by pointing out some paradoxes of Indian history. So these paradoxes, we are a pretty ancient civilization, and I hope I'll make a case for that today, but we are positioned otherwise whether it be in uh, media, in textbooks, in popular thinking and so on. We have been knowledge producers, but we are positioned otherwise. We have very strong index sources and references, but these are ignored, devalued and discredited in today's discourse. So we need a critique of methods and some mechanism to validate the narratives. Now I have a science background, so I bring a science bias to the discourse. So that is where I come from. I'd like to also point out one of the greatest dishonesties of our times. We are told that the Indian civilization impacted every country and civilization to its east, including China, Korea, Japan, and all of these countries. However, it did not step one foot outside Afghanistan. So this is one more of those uh, very interesting paradoxes that we have to live with. And this is a, I'll, I'll show how this is a consequence of some of the discourses that have been thrust on us. So in order to understand some of the problems that afflict us in our understanding of history today, we need to go to the roots of some of these uh, narratives, and that's those are the colonial um, Indology. Because they set the stage for erasure, distortion, errors, widespread devaluation, discrediting of ind Indic sources, led to a loss of continuity with our past and also a loss of history of our civilization. I've just put two or three gentlemen over here, but there are a whole lot of uh, who's who in this who are uh, complicit in this uh, 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 narration of history. William Jones. He uh, came to India uh, and, uh, to form, uh, he was a founder of the Asiatic Society. He found common roots between Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. And uh, he proposed that they probably have some kind of a relationship. He was not very sure about it, but he suggested this probably the Aryan people are all related. He introduced that idea of Aryans. He was also the first person who distorted the Puranic genealogies. When he attempted to write a history of India, he found that India had a, a Puranic genealogy spreading to about 5,000 years. And he being the very good Masonic scholar that he was from the Anglican Church of those days, presumed that God created the world in 4004 BCE as any self-respecting Englishman of that era would uh, think. And when uh, he also thought that God destroyed the world through Noah's flood in around 3000 BCE. And nothing could have survived that flood, so any history should be post-dated from that period. When confronted with enormous genealog uh, chronologies in the Indian context, these people took it on themselves to correct what they called were the distortions in the Indian calendar. So they infantilized the Indian context and saw themselves as having the white man's burden of having to correct some of the uh, chronological problems in the Indian calendar. So they cherry picked certain dates out of the calendar and you know, when you take a 5,000 year genealogy and put it to 1,600 years, you can't do that with a lot of distortions. And that's where the first set of distortions came in. Bentley was a very interesting gentleman. He was a um, missionary, and he was one of the strongest critiques of Hindu astronomy. One of his uh, contentions were that the texts were all forged in later periods to pretend great antiquity. Uh, Max Muller, we all know, he dated Vedas to the first millennium BC on linguistic analysis. Early in his career, he proposed that Aryans were a race, but later in his career, he recanted and said that Aryans should be seen as a linguistic category rather than as a racial category. Herbert Risley was an anthropologist, and he used a discredited race science using the ratio of the width and the length of the nose as a metric using which they could classify the races of people. And he managed to come up with this color-coded map of India of those days, where he saw so many races in India. He was also the census commissioner 
in 1901, the census in British India. So he entrenched the notion of Aryan as a, as a race. He also entrenched caste in the census of 1901. He created, yes, I use the word created because that's what he did. He created 2,378 castes. Contrary to what one might think, when you're confronted with 2,000 lists, when you write it in a gazette, you probably would write it in alphabetical order for easy retrieval of information. However, he ordered them in social preference. And the social preference is again a reflection of the biases that is he brought into the discourse, and uh, he entrenched certain things with that. Bottom line, the narrative from the quest for the Indian identity is that Aryans invaded India around 1500 BCE. The Dravidians are driven south. Aryans impose Vedic religion, oppression of Dravidians by Brahminical priesthood. Oppression caused Dravidian poverty and backwardness, and the Dravidians are a separate race and religion. So I see this as a failure to inculcate a national identity due to a failure of positive narration of history the inability to connect to the past. So almost all of us, unfortunately, have internalized certain values from our education system, and we are all connected and not connected and uh, rudderless. So this is what I call the great Indian quest for an identity. Many of us can't identify with the underlying unity that is existing in this country as a civilization for thousands of years. So today you find discourses where people see a religious identity for themselves, the so-called caste identity, regional identities, language identity, or the Aryan Dravidian identity. Some people, youngsters these days, also go about saying, I only have a corporate identity. I work for Facebook, I work for Google, and that's who I am. And a few more enlightened youngsters go around saying that, I don't believe in any of this. I'm a global citizen. <laughs> so all of this, I believe, is a failure. It's a failure of the education system to allow young people and others to connect to the past and acquire a healthy identity. That inability has caused people to express themselves in these, these ways. And I say that each of these distorts and undermines the underlying framework of unity of the people. And some of these are utterly spurious. So I'm going to talk about the Aryan Dravidian identity also because it goes to the root of who we are as a people. And uh, as a consequence of this, we also have a young chronology for India. Indic sources are disregarded or trivialized. And an entrenched, divisive narrative unfortunately stays in place. So I am still setting up my problem. I have not come to the thrux, uh, thrust of my talk. So can we validate the current narratives using science? Like I told you, my biases are science. And I am asking these questions. Can we bring in archaeoastronomy, archaeogenetics, archaeology, geology, climate studies, in an effort to uncover some of the truth, if so, in our narratives? So here is my case for the untold story of the Indian civilization. I'd like to pose it along these four questions. Is the Aryan invasion migration theory valid? How ancient is the Indian civilization? What did the ancient Indians know? Was India a source or a sink for knowledge? You must understand there's an allegation that most of Indian knowledge came from the Greeks or the Babylons and so on. And I'd like to position that question to ask, was it a source or a sink for knowledge? So I'll highlight the untold story in each of these. The very first story, is the Aryan invasion migration theory valid? So when we pose a problem, we need to first define the contours of the problem. That's what a scientist does. Yeah. Good scientist. <laughs> Tries to pose the contours of the problem. So here, the problem states that the current narrative on the Aryan invasion theory, bands of male warriors from Central Asia invaded or migrated to India around 1500 BCE. They effectively replaced the existing civilizations and brought an entirely new Vedic religion, Sanskrit language, and Vedic ecosystem. So we might think today that this Aryan invasion theory that had started from colonial times only impacts the uh, Indian people. But unfortunately, what we find is that it has become a much bigger problem. It has, become, it has evolved into a quest for the Western identity. The Western people, ever since William Jones saw the commonality of languages, would like to address the question, who are they as a people? Because they speak something called Indo-European language, and this is supposed to have an ancestral language called a Proto-Indo-European language. And in order to find out who they are as a people, they first need to address, who are the Indians? Once they talk about who the Indians are, then they can say who the Westerners are. So today we find that it is entrenched in the quest for the Western identity. So early scholars used a mechanism called comparative linguistics 
Comparative linguistics involves, if I suspect there's a, a relationship between a basket of uh, languages, they would take about a dictionary of 100 to 200 common words, universal words like hand, mouth, face, eat, sleep, you know, common words that we use in a language. And they try to see the cognates or where a phoneme might change from one to another in a language and try to see the distance between one language and any other language. Once they find two languages statistically close, then they'll place them next to each other. So this is how eventually you have a tree model appearing out of looking at how close one language is related to another language in the context of these 200 words or so. So you have this so-called Proto-Indo-European, which is supposed to be the ancestor of all these languages. And categories like Balto, Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, Hellenic, Indo-Iranian, and over here you have the Indic and the Iranian. Then you have Sanskrit in all of these languages. I'd like to point out as an engineer and a scientist that this is a static model which we can use something called similarity transformation to transform to any other origin. What do I mean by all the jargon? What I mean is there is no context of chronology here. There is only a context of nearness, a measure of nearness. So if I write a matrix of these things, language and nearness to everything else, then I might be able to use, instead of Proto-Indo-European, use Sanskrit as a root and transform with a new matrix, transform everything to Sanskrit. The results will be 100% valid still, mathematically. So it's an incomplete method, in other words. The tree model is an idealization. So the criticism that people levied at uh, linguistic methods led them to say, why don't we try to fortify our linguistic methods with archaeology? If we can find some archaeological artifacts that uh, 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 collaborate what we're seeing in linguistics, maybe we have a more powerful theory. So once again, the quest for Western identity continues with archaeology. Indian identity is key in the positioning of the Western identity. AIT is both the centerpiece as well as the tail end of the Western narrative. And I'll explain why. Today, we have two main narrators. These are the thought leaders in those narrators. Maria Gimbutas. She proposed the Kurgan or the Steppe hypothesis in 1950s. And she said that the Indo-European expansionism happened in three waves between 4000 BC to 1500 BC, the domestication of the horse and those kinds of things. Professor Colin Renfro from Cambridge, 1987, he proposed the Anatolian hypothesis. Anatolia is Turkey. And he proposed that the invention of agriculture and its spread throughout the world was the impetus for the spread of the Indo-European languages also. That was his proposal. Today, there are some people who say genetics favors the Kurgan hypothesis. And even if you have a notion of time that can come into a comparative linguistics, these models are only valid for 3,000 years. You can't push it beyond 3,000 years. So 6,500 is too old for any kind of analysis that you can do. So people favor this. But from time to time, you still find papers that uh, call out the Anatolian hypothesis. So what is this uh, kurgan steppe hypothesis? Here we are, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, a people called the Yamna culture existing over here. At the same period of time, 3500 BCE, you have people like the Harappa, Birana, Meghar, Bimbetka in Central India, Lothal, Western India, Edekal in Kerala, all of these people existing over here. And here you have Sumeria, and here you have Egypt. So it's not as if this is the story of civilization. Civilization existed. It's only a story of the quest for the Western identity. Who are the Indo-European people? Their origins are supposed to be in this Yamna culture emanating from the domestication of the horse, and stone idols is their claim to the archaeological finds over there, which are trying to tie up to a theory. By 2500 BC, these people had spread to the west, becoming the corded ware people, and to the east, calling uh, uh, the Andronovo uh, culture. Indus Valley civilization consolidation here, the Elamites, the Sumerians, Egyptians, and so on. By 1500 BC, you see that these people have become more specialized into the Mycenaean people, the Hittites, the Babylonians, and so on. And you find a people called the BMAC, Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex. And the tail end of this, you see, enters into Sindh and into India. And this is the beginning of the Aryan invasion theory for us. But what I'd like to point out is that there's a huge theory behind it. So if we attempt to debunk the AIT, as scientists, we must also debunk the rest of it. Otherwise, we have done an incomplete piece of work. So let us see where we can take this. By 500 BCE, the common narrative states that the Indo-Aryans had entrenched into this part of India. And you see the appearance of a people called Davidian. 
they appear in the context over here. So here is an example of the archaeology. Uh, this one is a burial mound from Kazakhstan, 500 BCE. And uh, this one is a Kurgan burial from Urals in around uh, 500 BCE. Here is a, a 4,000 years ago a chariot burial in Georgia. And this one shows, uh, for those of you who are astute and observe, observant, you see that these wheels don't have spokes. They are solid wheels. They don't have spokes on them. So one more example of the corded ware. When I talked about corded ware, it refers to these pottery. And you see these striations in these pots. So when the pots are being made out of clay and they're still wet, the innovation was to tie a rope around it. And that rope would leave its marks as a decoration. So that advancement in technology is uh, identified in the archaeological record as corded ware people. So uh, what, what I've done over here is to present to you the problem. I presented to you the Aryan invasion theory model. I've shown to you it's much bigger than what we as Indians are exposed to. It is the quest for the Western identity. And if we had to debunk AIT, we need to debunk a whole lot of other things here also. Now I go to the main part of this discussion where I want to examine the evidence using archaeogenetics. Each of us is a walking archaeogenetic artifact because we contain the sum total of mutations of a lot of our ancestors from the past, provided they have not eradicated from our genetic record into noise and other such things. We still have a lot of mutations over there. So the methodology is people take the maternal mitochondrial DNA field data or the Y chromosomal field data. They do some mathematical analysis on this. And finally, the results are the inferences are mapped back to the real world with some kind of a narrative. So we're going to examine some of these things. We first need to pay homage to this professor, because he's the one who started this whole line of thinking. Professor Luca Cavelli Sforza, who in 1994 wrote this book, The History and Geography of the Human Genes. A very, very influential book that set people to work on these things. He studied the differences among the genomes of different people in the world. And he said differences help to infer which people are most closely related with which other people. And he studied the human evolution and the uh, human population history. We should also re uh, re uh, recollect that the human genome was only uncoded, decoded in some time in this time frame. It was very expensive to decode this in those days. The cost has fallen today. Today you can go to 23andMe or to other such place. $99 you can get a genetic profile of who you are. But in those days, it was super expensive. So only universities and a few people could do that. I'd like to talk to you about the work of Stephen Oppenheimer, who in 2003 worked on the maternal mitochondrial DNA in an effort to establish who are we as a people, uh, the Homo sapien. His story begins somewhere in 150,000 years ago, but I prefer to start the story about 85,000 years ago when a group of individuals left Africa and walked along the coastal areas, Sindh, uh, Iran, Sindh, in the triangular part of India, all the way to Sumatra, all the way to Taiwan. So uh, Stephen Oppenheimer states that all the non-African people of the world are related to this group of people who left Africa. <coughs> Two questions. What was the migration model? And why did they not head westwards? Why did they come eastwards? The migration model was never one of people saying, hey, let's walk all the way to Australia. It was never one of those things. Rather, the, the situation was that a group of people living in a place if after maybe living there for a few years, they have the water is polluted, or the resources have run dry, or some issues are there, the whole family just goes one kilometer down the road and starts a new life. So it is a generation by generation movement. It never was a continuous focused walking, walking, walking till they find some place. Generation by generation migration. The best model we have is the Bushman society. Bushmen do not have possessions. Today, if we are all tied to the land because you have a house or a flat or land or something, you have a car, your kids go to school somewhere. So we can't uproot ourselves and go to another place. We are tied over here. But the ancient society, they had nothing. They could easily move from one place to another, no biggie at all. They could easily do things like that. So this is the model. Why did they not head westwards? Well, in the time frame under question, there was one more species of human living in uh, Europe as well as uh, up to Iran, up to Chagai Hills. And this species is called Neanderthals. Today, the Homo sapien, after generations of good nutrition, we are about six feet tall, about 70 kilograms, and those kinds of things. 
But the early Homo sapien was maybe about 4.5 feet tall and maybe about 40 kilograms, 50 kilograms. He did not want to confront the more uh, uh, bigger Neanderthal. So they hid along the beach and they walked in this path. And Stephen Oppenheimer provides some archaeological evidence also to support such an assertion. 74,000 years ago, there was a super volcano in Sumatra. This is called the Mount Toba event. It caused a six-year nuclear winter and an instant 1,000-year ice age with a dramatic population crash to less than 10,000 breeding individuals. Volcanic ash from this eruption covered India and Pakistan by up to five meters. If you can imagine, five meters of ash all over India and Pakistan had extincted the human race. This picture over here shows you uh, excavation in Jwalapuram in uh, Andhra Pradesh, where even today they find the ash layer. And here's the most exciting piece of news. Under the ash layer, they find human artifacts, showing that humans had lived before the Toba event. And then you find the ash layer, and you find later uh, uh, artifacts and so on. The researcher who works in that is Ravi Kori Setar. He's the one who works in this uh, work. 65,000 years or so, the ice ages had ended, and the warming of Western Europe took place. And that warming coincided with the extinction of the Neanderthal. They just disappeared from the fossil record. You don't find them. You don't find them anymore. And uh, we don't know whether they died by disease or war or what happened. But they left a vacuum. And that vacuum was filled in by the Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens from this part of the world, approximately Sindh and Gujarat, they're the ones who apparently left and crossed the Bosphorus and moved on and became the future Europeans. Approximately 40,000 years ago, Groups of people from this part of India, from Sumeria, from eastern part of India, and from other regions, they joined in Siberia and crossed the land bridge at that time, the Bering Strait, to the north and South America, and became the future Native Americans. So this is the story of the ancient human migration according to the maternal mitochondrial DNA, as laid out in a very early time frame, 2003, by Stephen Oppenheimer. However, I'm nowhere close to talking about Aryans. Aryans are a much more recent invention, and now we've been talking about 70,000 years, 60,000 years, and those kinds of things. So let's fast forward to 12,000 years. I'd like to present a very influential paper in 2013 from the American Journal of Human Genetics. This is by Priya Murjani and uh, Professor Kumarasamy Thangaraj. These are all from the CCMB in Hyderabad, a very uh, famous institute. Say that they took one of the largest samples of uh, Indians from across different regions, different uh, backgrounds, and so on, to try and identify the question of who are we as a people. So their research methodology, they use a genome-wide data, not the X or Y chromosome, genome-wide data. They postulated an ancestral North Indian and an ancestral South Indian population. And their interest was to show how are the current populations derived from these ancient populations. What is the relationship between them and us? That is the question they set out to answer. Well, they said that the ancestral North Indian and South Indian diverged from a common ancestor 60,000 years ago, correlating very well with what Stephen Oppenheimer has been saying, ancient man came into India in a certain time frame. They also found that they existed side by side without mixing for an exceedingly long period of time. Until about 2000 BCE, 4,000 years ago, there was some event that caused a very great amount of mixing. Not topical mixing, not very small regional mixing, but pervasive mixing of the Indian population. That took place for a period of 2,000 years, where they were marrying between uh, each other. And then, for, from the turn of this current era, they have been endogamous, more or less endogamous. I caution you not to jump to conclusions and think that this is the birth of the caste system and things of that nature, because later on we'll disprove that also. Just interesting to note some of these things that are present in the genetic record. That is what they're bringing out. Their conclusion, they try to address the question of when in the genetic record do we have any trace of Central Asian genes? Because there's an allegation that Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE. So they must have left some genetic imprint to the current populations. So they said to find any evidence of Central Asian genes, they, they looked 2,000 years back, 3,000 years back, 4,000 years back, 5,000 years back, 6,000 years back, no trace at all. They had to go all the way to 12,500 years 
before they found any evidence of Central Asian genes in the ancestral North Indian population. A very, very powerful conclusion that says that if you think Aryans injected some genetic content around uh, uh, 1500 BCE, at least this research says they did not find any evidence of shared ancestry between ANI and groups in West Eurasia within the past 12,500 years. I'd like to point out one more paper to you. This paper is from 2012 by Professor Ramaswamy Pichapan of the National Ge Genographic Consortium. He studied 1,680 individuals from Tamil Nadu in various caste and tribal societies. And he showed that endogamy in the south, if we can think of endogamy as a proxy for the caste system, he says that endogamy is 6,000 years old in southern India at least. What does this mean? We have been told from that narrator that Aryans entrenched themselves in India in 500 BCE. That's when the Dravidians appeared in the record. Then they imposed their Vedic structure and their caste system on the Dravidians. So any endogamy as a result of caste system must be present the genetic record from around 200 BCE or 300 BCE and so on. However, in southern India, it is at least 6,000 years old, according to this professor. It predates the so-called Aryan invasion theory by more than 2,000 years. A lot of people come and tell me, um, Dr. Vedan, this is all well and good, but uh, look at me, I'm so dark. Look at this guy, he's so fair. So surely we are not the same people. We are two races, we are different people, and uh, so on. So how do we address issues like that? So it turns out that this paper in 2013 says that the light skin allele of SLC 24A5 in South Asians and Europeans shares identity by descent. In common language, what it is saying is this mutation appeared in the genetic record approximately 30,000 years ago. And this uh, mutation is common between Europeans and South Asians. It controls the expression of melanin. It is there in the 15th chromosome of the human body. So it basically controls the expression of melanin and what kind of skin tone we'll take as a result of absorbing sunlight and so on. This 30,000 years ago framework also puts it perhaps in the vicinity of India's where this mutation might have taken place during the early migration periods. And it is mostly in the ancestral North Indian population, but also in the Southern Indian population and mostly also pres present in Europeans. That is the skin tone issue. There is some evidence for outward migration this paper in 2013, they basically found some uh, skeletons in Syria belonging to the Roman period. When they analyzed these skeletons, they found that the genetic content in those skeletons is related to the northern Indian population. Very interesting uh, piece of work over here. So it turns out that uh, Professor Subhash Kak talks about the drying up of the Saraswati River and he says that led to an outward migration. If we take that as a hypothesis, it, it appears that there's at least one data point that seems to be collaborating what he said in the said time frame. So far, also promised that we'll look at this uh, genetic evidence that people have been talking about for the Aryan invasion theory. So in 2015, there were three papers that came out in, gen in um, Nature, in the journal Nature, and caused great excitement in media because there are people going around to saying that these papers show the final support for the Aryan invasion theory. And uh, here in India, this Tony Joseph of the Hindu had an exuberant write-up saying that the Aryan invasion theory is settled based upon these papers and so on. So it deserves closer scrutiny. What did those papers actually say and what, what is going on over here? Well, the works are based on R1A. R1A is on, from the Y chromosome. And uh, we need to understand the origins of the R1A. R1A is supposed to have appeared in the genetic record about 25,000 years ago. And this researcher, Peter Underhill, 2014, based on 16,000 samples from 126 populations, he came to a conclusion that the mutation appeared somewhere near Iran. That's where the R1A appeared into the mutation record. Now, if you're going to talk about the story of the Aryans, you can't use a mutation that is 25,000 years old. You'd like to have a data that is more resolution in the time frame that you're interested in. The time frame that we're interested in is around 2000 BCE to 1500 BCE. So they use the subclades Z282 and Z93, which appeared into the record, a mutation record around uh, uh, 6,000 years ago. Now it turns out that a whole lot of other researchers, Kevisid, Mirabel, Mascarenhas as an example, 
when they say where did these things enter into the record this person says it appeared in the south or in west asia this person says both in south asia and central asia this person says z93 appeared in west asia in other words there are a whole lot of researches out there where there's no consensus still where did the rna even come into the record let alone their subclades the consensus if we look at what the researchers are saying appears that even the rna also have, seems to have appeared in the south asian record and perhaps gone out from there nevertheless the uh, the genetic hunt continues people continue to look at data in various ways to try and address this particular issue so conclusion from the genetic studies is that the results are primary evidence and can only serve as supporting evidence <coughs> sorry the results are not primary evidence it can only serve as supporting evidence why do i say this i say this because like i told you earlier the methodology in genetics is you first get the field data saliva swabs sequencing and you get the data get all the mutations and so on so far so good the next you do mathematical analysis clustering and try to get a principal component analysis or if it is a admixture kind of problem you do a certain other set of operations called uh, sqp analysis and all those kinds of things after you're done all of this fantastic field work as well as mathematical work you're left with a bunch of numbers now you're left with the unenviable position of saying if i got two candidate numbers let's say one of them 0.1 other one is uh, 0.1 point uh, i mean 0.101 you're now in a position by saying that the difference between these two numbers provides me resolution to make some call into something to social theory you see you're in a situation where you have to interpret the numbers and then map it back into a narrator that is where the subjective bias enters into the process that is where people have got to do great diligence is the data valid what will happen if i take a few pieces of data out and put some other data how sensitive are your results is the composition of your population valid are the numbers that you have taken is that valid second the methodology that you used is that the best in class methodology third the inferences that you made is that correct so many critiques can be made in the genetic papers that uh, i have been reading so that's why i come finally with the statement that they are not primary evidence it can only serve as supporting evidence one has got to see sensitivity of the result of population size composition assumptions need to be careful in attempting to align mathematical numbers alongside a narrative to avoid subjective biases that can creep into the result bottom line from what we have examined there is no evidence of a genetic inflow into india following a postulated indo-european language expansion there is neither an aryan gene nor a dravidian gene we are essentially the same okay so far i presented to you the archaeogenetics evidence i'm going now to an entirely new area talking about the archaeological evidence that we have if you look at the archaeological artifacts found in india from 40000 years ago all over india you have got artifacts of different periods of time i don't like these words stone age middle age and all these kind of things because they conjure up ima- imaginations of a romantic era where people were uncivilized and brutish and uh, those kinds of ca- cartoonish images unfortunately i took this map from a secular source and i had to go with that <laughs> terminology but i wouldn't have called it this so all over india you find uh, evidence of uh, settlements and those kinds of things <coughs> here's an example from 35000 years ago in jwalapuram rock shelter some of the artifacts they found over there here is from bimbetka 35000 years ago uh, rock art and you also see in the same place a horse with a rider very intriguing uh, considering all the bruhaha and uh, harappa and horse and those kinds of things there is also some noises that this is a later period this is not belonging to the same period as this nevertheless it's still an ancient uh, piece of art in uh, kerala edakal caves 9000 years ago you have something that appears to be like writing and what is more intriguing is that there appears to be a sign that is used in edakal that is common with the harappa signs a man with a jar that appears in harappa it also appears in edakal so people are speculating could there have been some kind of a connection between these two cultures birana rakigar all of us know haryana up to 10000 years ago now we found excavations and artifacts Ketavaram, Andhra Pradesh, 8,000 years ago. Ramachandrapuram, Telangana, 12,000 years ago. This is a paper from uh, ASI in 2008 that talks about all the artifacts found in Birana and there's various uh, periodizations they've made, calendar year before present, about 2,750 years, all the way to 9,550 years when they found incised pottery and other things. 
I put this thing over here, two seals from Mohenjo-daro, seal number 420 and seal number 430. This is the work of Professor Abhayankar and this is reported in the Bulletin of uh, Astronomical Society of India, 1993. He says these two seals appear to show evidence of ar uh, astronomical encoding in these things. He, coined, he calls out these four figurines over here at the sides of the Shiva kind of, uh, Pashupati kind of uh, symbol over here. And he says these represent the equinox and solstice, the four cardinal positions. Cardinal positions of astronomy are the two solstices and the equinox positions. So there are four of them. So he says that these represent this. What does it mean? Typically, when a solstice occurs, it might be in a certain constellation. Remember, the Rashis are represented by animals and so on. So it would only be true for a period of time because of a phenomenon called precession. I'll talk about that later on. So these animal figurines, he points out, could be the Rashis around that time, constellations around that time, and he, he brings in the idea that the sea, this 420, 3000 years ago, shows this kind of a scenario. The other seal shows a very rare planetary alignment. These standing seven figurines show a planetary alignment in 3102 BCE. And I'll point out this one also a little later on. Very intriguing. This appears to show a continuity of thought, a continuity of thought from the Harappan times into the Vedic times, if we can call it that. Today we are led to think that Harappa was there, then Vedic period came, and so on and so forth. But these two seals appear to show a continuity of thought. This is from a paper in Episodes in March 2003 from the National Institute of Ocean Technology in Chennai, India. So they took a ship off the west coast of India in Dwaraka and, and equipped with sonar and decided to uh, uh, map the ocean floor with sonar. So they found a 9 kilometer long feature 40 meters below the sea level, which they expect as the remnants of a city wall or a fortification and those kinds of things. What is more exciting is they dredged up a piece of wood which they were able to send it to the National uh, Geophysical Research uh, Institute in Hyderabad, as well as the Institute of Earth Science in Hanover, Germany. And they came back with a carbon dating of uh, 8,500 years to 9,300 years before present, as a date of this artifact, showing very great antiquity for this artifact at least. In recent times, we have been told about the story of Kuradi. Kuradi has got an exciting story behind it. Excuse me. Archaeologists had wanted to dig in um, Madurai, However, Madurai is like any other Indian city, settled, a very expensive land, no place to obtain land for archaeology and so on. So he used his intuition and said that in ancient Madurai, if there are supply chains coming in, where were the highways? And where is one day's worth journey from outside of Madurai? That's where a camp might have been. Well, he went to Kuradi and he said that's where it might have been and he struck gold over there because he found an urban uh, settlement right there in Kuradi. Outstanding methods used by this uh, uh, archaeologist. And they found, they found several artifacts over there. However, the real story is not there. The real story is in this news item that came out saying that they excavated up to 4.5 meters depth at uh, Kuradi. However, they sent samples from 2 meter depth to Florida, USA for carbon dating, and they came back with a date of around 300 BCE. Everybody was happy. They're happy because it fits into the common narrative beautifully and nobody questions. However, I scratched my head and said, what on earth is this? ASI reported 4.5 meters depth of excavation. If you think the top layer is 2017, then the two meters down by their own carbon dating is 2,200 years. Therefore, every meter in depth should correspond to 1,100 years by a linear scaling which means 4.5 meters should correspond to approximately 5,000 years before present. That is 3,000 BCE. So why would ASI only report the middle layer result? Why would they not say we found a range of artifacts from the bottommost layer to 3,000 BCE to around 500 BCE? That would have been a much more honest representation of what was found. Well, it's not very surprising to think what's going on because you see the, in October 2017, Tamil Nadu government took over the Kuradi excavations. And also the archaeologist involved in Kuradi project was transferred out of there. So there is clearly an attempt to uh, control the narrative coming out of Kuradi. If people were to come out saying that Kuradi is 3000 years old, uh, sorry, 3000 BCE, then they are in an uncomfortable situation of trying to explain what are we teaching our school children? 
Why are our school children still learning that 500 BC is when Dravidians appeared in the record and uh, Vedic structure was imposed on them? So any urban settlement in South is only 300 BC and older. They have to explain that. I believe they have taken the easy way out. I honestly hope that I am mistaken. But uh, the, uh, the, this, this is a very strong uh, uh, piece of uh, data jumping out at us. The glass factories of Arikamedu. Arikamedu is one of the most well-kept secrets of Puducherry. If you go to Pondicherry and you ask a rickshaw driver, please take me to uh, Arikamedu, he'll scratch his head, he'll have no idea. But I was lucky to find a local living there and uh, he appeared to know where it was. And so we took off in his car and after searching for some time, there are no roads to go there. You had to cross some fields and so on. We were able to go to Arikamedu. There's a picture of me over there. This is mentioned in the Periplus of Erythrean Sea. Periplus of Erythrean Sea is a port sailor's document that says where are the trading ports for Roman sailors. In that it finds a mention. They traded in muslin and glass beads. Mortimer Wheeler, he was the first guy to excavate it over here. He placed it to 100 BC to 100 current era. He did this because he found a bust of Augustus Caesar there. And if, when he found a bust of Caesar, he said 30 current era. So let's put the date from 100 BC to uh, 100 current era. That was the way he dated it. Vimala Begley was one of the archaeologists from 89 to 92. And she said the date must be 200 BC to 700 current era. Now, all over the Indo-Pacific, you find glass beads. If you Google for Indo-Pacific glass beads, you'll find enormous numbers of papers out there. These glass beads have been found in Japan, Korea, China, Bali, Indonesia, all of these places. And they all bear the chemical signature of the factories in Arikameda. In other words, the, the metallurgy, sorry, the minerals used in making the silica and other things bear the signature of Arikameda. That's what it means. So these have been dated up to 300 BC and so on. So that gives us pause to wonder whether it is older than what they're telling us. Well, I found this diary by Vimla Begley and she says that Trench 7 is the one that yielded the oldest material we uncovered back to the 2nd century BC. We had to stop working because we were under the water table and even a large pump could not keep the water out. In other words, it was not the terminus of finding artifacts that is 200 BCE, but rather a technological issue that did not allow them to go deeper. So today the ASI has covered it up once again with mud and all this. So behind this wall, you see a coconut grove growing. It's under the coconut grove that uh, Arikamedus remains are. You can't see that today. If you look at a map of, the, of, our, uh, of India with places named the epics, this map is from Jijit Revi. You find that all over India, you find instances of uh, habitation. So the epics are deeply tied to the geography of the land. Unfortunately, epics are ignored as sources of history. And in the textbook narratives, this is what we teach our children. We teach our children that here we had Harappa and uh, commenced about uh, 5,000 years ago and declined 3.6 thousand years ago and empty lands over here. So you can see the irony of what uh, we have seen just in a very few slides over here and what we teach our children. It's very, very unfortunate. So the Aryan invasion theory, the, the genetic evidence shows great antiquity of the Indian people. All non-African people are descended from, if we can call it Indian stock, because there's no identity as India in those days. But anyway, we'll call it that, that geographical region, Indian stock. No evidence of genes from Central Asia from at least 12,500 years ago. Evidence of differentiation more than 6,000 years old in, uh, in Tamil Nadu. So there is no invasion. I didn't talk about this, but climate change caused collapse of IVC. Archaeology shows ancient artifacts that predate the so-called invasion period, whether you look in the North India, Western India, Southern India, or Central India. Every place we find evidence of uh, great antiquity. So the question is, if invading Aryans are supposed to have destroyed Indus Valley civilization, if there's no AIT, then what caused the collapse? Very uh, obvious question to ask. <coughs> this paper from Nature, 2014, says a 200-year drought doomed the Indus Valley civilization. And if you dig deeper, you find several such events in the past. An 8.2 kilo year event is a 300-year dry event. 5.9 kilo year event is entrance doubt. 4.2 kilo year event which caused a collapse of Mesopotamia and migration of IVC 
And Subhash Kak also points out the drying up of the Saraswati, which terminated finally in uh, 3.9 uh, thousand years ago. One more, uh, uh, one more thing to think about in the Indian context. We are told that the Aryans came, impressed the southern Indians, the, the Dravidians to go to the south, imposed the caste system on them, and the uh, Vedic social uh, structures caused oppression of the Dravidian people and caused widespread poverty. That is a narrator that many have internalized. So we want to find out what caused poverty in India. I'd like to point out two works. This is Angus Madison, who is a, a historical economist in Netherlands. He studied the economies of the world from the, from the turn of the current uh, era, one, all the way to 2003. He shows that the Indian GDP, as a percentage of the world GDP, India had one of the highest percentages, around 33% of the share of the world uh, GDP, followed by China around 25% or so, and Western Europe was all the way down here in about 15% or so. India went through a period of decline through the invasion periods, the Muslim periods, and so on, reaching a bottom over here, and rising somewhat at this uh, inflection point, which corresponds to the colonialists coming to India in 1700 BC, uh, current era. After that, what you see is a rapid decline in the fortunes of India at the same time as which Western Europe went up. Also, the United States went up with slavery and other such things. You can see this also going up. This is not incidental to our talk, but this is more incidental. This downfall correlating with this shows a transference of wealth from India into Western Europe caused widespread poverty. I'd like to point out the work by Will Durant. He's written an excellent book called Case for India. So I strongly urge everybody in this audience to download this from Google. It's a free book and try to read it. He came to India around 1930 and he was not sympathetic to the British cause. He's an American. So he came in and saw what the British had done. He was horrified. And he wrote this powerful book, The Case for India. So he shows, he tells what we already know. Robert Clive, who uh, traded money for guns and favor, East India Company, forcing Indians to buy, uh, sell cheap, buy exorbitantly extracted hundreds of millions of dollars. Indians were taxed at two times as England and three times as Scotland. All the costs of British conquest and development and administration in India was charged to Indians, including the First World War, Second World War, all the French battles that they had. Everything was charged to Indians. The British incurred a debt for Indians of 35 million in 1792. I believe these, uh, the dollar figure is as of 1930 when uh, Will Durant wrote this book. By 1860, it had become $500 million. By 1929, when Will Duran left India, it was $3.5 billion. After that was Second World War and so on. This figure probably had doubled or tripled by the time the British left India. So this is the debt that the British left India with. So if one of any of us have got any doubts about what caused poverty in India, these two graphs very powerfully show us what happened to India in recent times, the last 300 years or so. So I'm now going to a second part of my talk. How ancient is the Indian civilization as part of the untold story of India? So I'm going to be using archaeoastronomy as my key tool to uh, talk about this. Now, uh, archaeoastronomy researchers, what they do is they look, at, they look for instances of astronomical observations in our ancient texts, and they try to see when was such an observation true. And they use some tools of modern uh, uh, planetarium software or mathematics and so on and do that. Before I do that, I need to talk to you about precision. So our Earth is tilted at an axis of 23 degrees or so, and it is pointing, the northern hemisphere, the axis of rotation appears to point to a point in the sky, and it's pointing at something called Polaris. It spins from the west to east once in 24 hours. But in addition to the spin, it is also doing something else. If you played with a top as a child, you know the top, you tie a rope and do that, and the top spins very, very fast. You can visualize that sometimes when the top is spinning very, very fast, it's got a slow wobble. Can you visualize that? A fast spin and a slow wobble. So our Earth is doing that. Our Earth has got the fast spin is 24 hours. The slow wobble is 25,700 year cycle. So as a consequence of that, today, <clears throat> we are pointing at Polaris. This is our Dhruva today. In 3000 BCE, we were pointing at Thuban. And about uh, 14,000 years or so from now, we'll be pointing at Abhijit or the star called Vega. And that will be our pole star. This is just a consequence of uh, precision. This is a very important phenomenon for us to understand when we talk about Indian astronomy. 
because this is what will help us to date events in Indian astronomy. We need to first set the stage. What was the Indian astronomical model? The model was one of nakshatras and Rashi. Our ancient Indians, they divided the sky into several segments of 13 and one-third degree segments. They started from the eastern horizon and they said that let me divide the first 13 and one-third into the first nakshatra, the next 13 and one-third second nakshatra, third into the third nakshatra, all the way to the western horizon, but they didn't stop there. If this was the night sky, they knew there was the day sky that side. They divided that portion also of the sky into 13 and one-third degree segments and they formed 27 of them. These are the 27 nakshatras. If you multiply 27 by 13 and one third, you'll get 360 degrees, the full 360 degrees. Now it is not enough to divide it into nakshatras. You must also be able to recognize that tomorrow. So what they did was that first 13 and one third, they said, what is the brightest star in that segment of the sky? That brightest star, for example, it might have been Aldebaran. Aldebaran is the Arabic name. The Indian name is Rohini. So they said, because Rohini is there, I'm going to call it Rohini nakshatra. The next segment may be the brightest star or Spika. Spika is the star which in India we call Chitra, Chitra nakshatra. Next we have perhaps Zeta Piscium. Zeta Piscium is Revati nakshatra. So this way every nakshatra was identified by the principal brightest stars present in that segment of the sky and identified accordingly. So those are the 27 nakshatras that you see in this outer circle over here. They straddle the month what you see over here is the nakshatra chitra and below that is a chaitra masa so when the full moon appears over the chitra nakshatra that month is a chaitra month that is how ancient indians uh, observed months and so on similarly for falguni the falguna masa maga in other words they also divided the sky in 30 degree segments called the rashi and these are all the familiar rashis that we know so here is a listing of all the nakshatras in two of our ancient books, the Vedanga Jyotisha and the Surya Siddhanta. Vedanga Jyotisha is conservatively dated to 1400 BCE because of the phenomena contained therein. So that has got a listing of all the nakshatras and these are those nakshatras. Surya Siddhanta is conservatively dated to 700 BCE or 400 current era. Take your pick. There's a lot of controversy over there. And they too contain a list of nakshatras that seem to match each other. And here are the principal stars. Kritika is Eta Tauri, Rohini is Alpha Tauri, Mrigashira is uh, Lambda Orionis, and so on, all the way to Revati, Zeta Piscium, and so on. How did Indians date? Um, uh, how, how can we use uh, Indian astronomy and do dating? As an example, if somebody says Rama was born in the Chaitra Masa, it means the full moon was in Chitra Nakshatra. Let me go back to this picture over here. If the full moon is here, that means 180 degrees away here, the sun would have been here. So the sun is an Ashwini. So just by one statement that Rama was born in Chaitra Masa, two data points jump out at me. The full moon was in Chitra Nakshatra, the sun was an Ashwini Nakshatra. You see what, what I'm saying? So that's one way of uh, <coughs> talking about things. Another example, Varsha Ritu began in Ashada Masa. If somebody says that, Varsha Ritu means rainy season. It means the full moon was in Ashada nakshatra and the sun was in Punar Vashu nakshatra, 180 degrees away. At present, however, in, in India, rainy season happens when the sun is in the Mriga nakshatra. So there are two nakshatra difference between the time when this was written and today. Then we know that this happened because of precision. Some writer, when he was writing, the rainy season happened in Ashada nakshatra. So he notes that. However, today, because uh, of precision that I talked to you about, we are no longer in that constellation. Things have moved on. The precision rate we can compute at 960 years per nakshatra. Therefore, approximately 2000 years ago, the statement was true. The statement was from Kalidasa's Megaduta. That's how today we'd be able to take any ancient observation and by studying its impact and studying the picture as of today, we'll be able to predict what was the precision effect between the time that was valid and today? That's how we date some of the events. Here is a, a graphic that I put to understand the night sky with Indian lens. This is on the day I started giving talks in the series. This is November 30th in uh, Bangalore, based in Bangalore. This is the eastern horizon, northern, uh, this is, sorry, east, north and west. The ground line is over here. So this is all the night side and this is all the day side. 
so whenever ancient indians talked about nakshatra it was always in relation to when the moon appears in the eastern horizon whether it is a full moon half moon quarter moon or even new moon when it appears over the eastern horizon what section of the sky was it in that defines a nakshatra for the day okay so whenever the moon appears in the eastern horizon what nakshatra is it in so here in this case i'm not sure you can read it on november 30th the moon appears in the eastern horizon approximately at 3 o'clock in the afternoon 15 hours and it appears in the revati nakshatra so that day the nakshatra is revati because of that phenomenon like to point out to you the pole star over here like to point out to you abhijit abhijit is over here and these circles that you're seeing over here these are projections of the earth's latitudes and longitudes on the sky okay earth's latitudes and longitudes projected to the sky become celestial coordinates so this one here corresponds to the celestial north pole this is now the latitudes right so uh, 90 degrees 80 degrees 70 60 50 40 30 20 10 and 0 0 refers to the celestial equator on the day of the equinox the sun would be exactly on the celestial equator in the remaining time the sun would appear to go north northwards up to 23.2 degrees and go 6 months southward to up to minus 23.3 degrees crossing the equinox these are the cardinal positions that our ancient indians knew about and whenever they commemorated any event like starting of a temple or some grant or some auspicious thing they would start it on such an auspicious day and they'll note when the solstice was here it was in kritika nakshatra or it was in revati nakshatra and those kinds of things so today we can uncode those statements to see when was it true like to talk to you about the start of kali yuga people at this point wonder what on earth am i doing why am i talking about kali yuga well it turns out that kali yuga is an absolute marker for all the indian calendars so uh, uh, for example aryabhata gives us age with respect to kali yuga many temple epigraphy talk about the age at uh, with respect to kali yuga badami for, for example in other places so Surya Siddhanta says Kali Yuga was a rare planet conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Sun and Moon in the Revati nakshatra. It turns out that this date was 18th February 3102 BCE. I simulated this in the planetary software and what you see is Revati nakshatra is over here. This is Sun, Chandra, Shukran, Venus, Guru, Jupiter and here you see uh, Mars, Mangala Deva is over here and I I can't read it from here I think it's Budan and this is shani so you see mercury and shani all of these things are clustered it is spread over a few nakshatras but the least square sphere is greatest at this point they seem to be clustered in the revati nakshatra so this was only possible for one time in the last 25000 years because of precession and that date corresponds to february 18 3102 There appears to be an ancient observation encoded in the Mahabharata in this particular reference a dialogue between Indra and Skanda contesting against Abhijit Vega the nakshatra Kritika Pleiades went to Vana the summer solstice to heat the summer then the star Abhijit slipped down in the sky <coughs> this caused a lot of angst in people because they said that stars don't slip down the sky here's an example of indian text taking flights of fantasy maybe they high on soma or whatever and they have done these kinds of works stars don't uh, slip in the sky then professor vartak came along and said wait a minute wait a minute it is actually encoding an astronomical phenomenon he said that more than 15000 years ago abhijit was the pole star so somebody in the indian context remembers a time when abhijit was a pole star and that cultural memory has been passed on generation to generation until such time the mahabharata was written down and they noticed at that time abhijit was no longer the pole star it is away from the pole from 90 degrees to 40 degrees almost and they say it slipped down in the sky so it's an amazing uh, instance that uh, we remember an incident that happened 15000 years ago approximately next kritika was a summer solstice approximately 24000 years ago so the bottom line of these two is that rishis have been observing the skies for almost 24000 years here are shown a graphic where 20 14000 years ago abhijit is over here you you remember in my earlier slide i showed to somewhere here 40 degrees or so but now it is over here 90 degrees shatapatha brahmana has got a statement that kritika never swerves from the east april 15th 2982 BCE is the only date when that would have been possible. 
This is a prescriptive statement done by Sage Yagnya Valkya, who tried to say, how do you construct a Vedic altar? How do you find the east direction? In order to tell the Vedic practitioner, the east direction is under Kritika. So come out when it is still dark, do your ritual bath, see where Kritika is, and the sun will appear soon over there. So align your Vedic altar along Kritika for maximum auspiciousness and do your uh, ritual. That is what he meant. Unfortunately, Kritika is on the celestial equator only on this day when it is true east. On every other day it is far away. So that date corresponds to this particular one. I, I have an entire uh, paper coming up on, on this one because I'm using this to date Shushruta. You can use this phenomenon to date Shushruta and I'll be doing that soon. Taitriya Samhita refers to Kritika in the winter solstice and this corresponds to a date of 28921 BCE. One more instance of Agastya in the extreme south. Now, Professor Abhayankar drew this particular graph. Uh, Agastya is the star called Canopus. Canopus is a star in the southern hemisphere. India is in the northern hemisphere because we are to the north of the equator, right? So we're in the northern hemisphere. Normally, we would not be able to see Canopus from India. But because precision has dipped in a certain direction, it is given as a view of that portion of the sky. Okay, that's the interpretation. So Professor Abhyankar drew a map of when would Canopus have been visible in India. This is 10,000 BCE, all the way going to 10,000 current era. He says the visibility started here in Kanyakumari, approximately 10,000 BCE. In Madras, approximately 8,500 BCE. In Vindhya, is about 5,000 uh, BCE. In New Delhi, around 3,000 BCE. We are somewhere here now. Maximum visibility all over India. We can see Canopus. <coughs> However, there's also a disappearance cycle. It will disappear because of precision. Approximately 10,000 years from now, it won't even be visible from Kanyakumari. So, he interprets that if Agastya was the first to cross the Vindhyas and see Canopus, then the date should be 5200 BCE. However, I caution that that may not be true because we also have a Puranic story that Agastya drank up the ocean because he wanted the devdas to come and kill the demons who lived under the ocean. So that could be an allegory for the last glacial maximum, which happened approximately 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BCE, when most of the water was locked up in ice, and you could have seen coastal areas far beyond today's coastal areas. <coughs> so if Agastya went to coastal India, Kanyakumari, that date should actually correspond to 10,000 BCE and not 5200 BCE. Just an example how archaeoastronomy can sometimes throw up instances where multiple interpretations can be there. There's a phenomenon called Rohini Shakata Beda. Very, very interesting. Rohini is a star called Aldebaran. It appears in the Brisha Nakshatra. There is a triangle that it forms in this, uh, sorry, Brisha Rashi, and it forms a triangle over here. This phenomenon is recounted in all these books, Surya Siddhanta, Brihat Samhita, Mahabhaskariya, Mahasiddhanta, Kandakatkaya, everybody in this chapter, sloka, they refer to this. What it, they say is, for example, Brihat Samhita, it says, when Saturn, Mars or a comet cuts the vein of Rohini, what shall I say, alas, for the whole world will perish being plunged in the ocean of misery. So this is the phenomenon they said. In other words, something cataclysmic would happen if Mars, Mars coming in over here, were to cut this triangle. Uh, in in uh, TIFR, these researchers tried to see when would Mars have cut this triangle, when was it possible. They found these dates, 5000 BCE, 9000 BCE and so on, and they attempted to make an interpretation of it. They tried to correlate it with the minimum of the ice age, the last glacial minimum, when most of the ice would have melted, water levels would have gone up, coastal civilizations would be flooded, and maybe that catas cataclysmic event was remembered along with Mars also cutting the uh, uh, this, this particular uh, triangle of Rohini and remembered in this manner. Very interesting phenomena. Conclusion from astronomy evidence, many instances of interest can be dated with astronomical observations encoded in the text. Date of Kali Yuga reveals a Vedic concept in place in India much earlier than the alleged uh, Aryan migrations. Dates preserved in Brahmanas and Upanishads reveal great antiquity. Observation of Abhijit shows very ancient knowledge of star positions, including Rohini Shakatabeda. There is evidence of great antiquity of Indians, and this is backed by archaeological finds. Just 10,000, maybe 10 years ago, I couldn't have made statements like this without looking like a fool, because people say, where is archaeology? 
nothing is there but now in birana we are gone up to about 8000 bc 9000 bc so right now archaeology is matured in the country to a point where these dates are no longer fantastic they are within the range of archaeology unfortunately this evidence is ignored in today's scholarship due to eurocentric idea that indian astronomy borrowed from the greeks after 300 bce and to align with the proto indo european narratives what we talked about earlier in other works i critique the works by david pingree and by uh, sedenberg and other eurocentric scholars who try to use reconstructed ideas of babylonian mathematics greek mathematics and based on the current day reconstructions they try to make a claim that those ideas came into india i've critiqued some of these things and shown that is not the case at all so i come to the third part of my talk how old is the indian civilization so uh, sorry i uh, at end of the second part how old are we Investigation of genetics shows a very ancient people living continuously in India since 85,000 years ago. Investigation in archaeology now shows artifacts from at least 10,000 years ago. Investigation in astronomical observations shows artifacts from 24,000 years ago. All of these things are now adding up to an untold story that we are a very ancient people that we have not been uh, 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 diligent with ourselves in talking about this. Now, there's an allegation of inflow of knowledge from Greeks and Babylons. So I pose the question, what did the Indians know before we go to these allegations itself? We know our traditional knowledge sources, Shruti, that which is heard, Vedas, Samhitas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, Upanishads, which are mantras, hymns, prayers, commentaries on hymns, rituals, philosophy, and so on. Then Smriti, that which is remembered, the six Vedangas, grammar, meter, astronomy, rituals, itihasas, texts on dharma, artha, kama, moksha, puranas, poetic works, commentary and shrutis, sutras and shastras of various schools of philosophy, the nibandhas, politics, medicine, culture, arts, Jain and Buddhist works and so on. Why I pointed out all these things is to show a matrix of ideas, a bedrock within which the Indian learning existed. So there's a very, very strong ecosystem of learning in India. And my colleague Sahana also has brought out this book that talks about ancient Indian universities, starting from forest universities to brick and mortar universities to other universities. All these things point out to us that we had a very strong ecosystem of formal learning as well as informal learning. I don't have a slide on informal learning, but all over India we know the artisans had enormous knowledge of their systems, whether it was metallurgy, whether it was architecture, whether it was uh, uh, anything else, any other kind of works. Artisans also had great amount of knowledge in addition to the formal knowledge sources. Here's an example. What did the Indians know? I just put down some schools and gurus and one-line descriptions. The Nyaya school one line description, all knowledge is not intrinsically valid. Most knowledge is not valid unless proven. And truth exists whether we human beings know it or not. Greatest exponent is Rishi Aksh Akshapada Gautama. Yoga, we all know, Yamas, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama and so on. Patanjali codified these things. Vaisheshika works on perception and inference. And uh, Kanada is one of the famous Rishis who did that. Samkhya, which works on systematic enumeration and rational examination, that Kapila. Purva Mimamsa, which requires reflection, consideration, profound thought, investigation, examination and discussion. Jaimini is one of the rishis. And uh, Uttara Mimamsa Vedanta, there are up to 10 schools now with Advaita and other such things. I like to point out these things to tell people who say that it was the Britishers who brought in a very formal way and rational way of thinking after their own discovery of the age of reason, age of rationalism and these kind of things. They are the first people who brought a scientific way of thinking. And I say, whoa, wait a minute. Have you even looked at some of the Indic systems that existed? Even today as a scientist, when I work, I do a systematic enumeration of all the facts known in the case. I put on everything that is known, then deep reflection, consideration, profound thought and investigation, rational examination, then I come to a conclusion on what is this all about. So even today we subconsciously use methods of our rishis, even though we might not know it, and we rarely attribute it to our own Indic knowledge systems. We appear to be very quick to grant the Westerners that they brought a rational way of thinking to the subcontinent, whereas this is very endemic to our uh, systems. I don't think I'll talk about this, too much to talk here. Some ancient texts, we had the Vedas, Upanishads, Vedanga Jyotisha, uh, which is an appendix to Rig Veda, authored by Lagada. The dating hinges on phenomena described therein. Winter solstice suggests 
1400 BCE. However, Michael Witzel, the professor of Sanskrit from Harvard, he says final centuries of BCE, hinting that it copied earlier Harappan and Babylonian data. This had me flabbergasted because here he's actually saying somebody could interpret Harappan data. <laughs> <laughs> we should find out what script the Harappan used and how they decoded that and how they wrote the Vedanga Jyotisha based upon that. So th this is the way the goalposts are changed. Whenever there is any kind of indication of antiquity that is, uh, cannot be contested, they come about with these convoluted ways of uh, talking where it copied from these things and so on. Surya Siddhanta, the versions show Vedic, uh, 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 sorry, traces of Vedanga Jyotisha. These, the text is lost, Vashishta Siddhanta, Paita Maha Siddhanta, Romaka and Polisa Siddhanta. Varaha Mehra, who wrote commentaries on that, remarks that the calculations had become obsolete even in his own time. That shows how ancient those things were. Why did they become obsolete? Because of precision. Because of precision, some of the calculations made there were no longer valid. Nakshatras were not where they were supposed to be. So Varaha Mehra said he could not use those things. Then you have works by Bhaskara 1, Bhaskara 2 and others. Some selected discoveries, the Vedic calendar 360 uh, days, 12 times 30 but averages to 365 over 6 years because of correction month. Vedanga jo, uh, Jyotisha Vedanga records astronomical data 4000 BCE. Excuse me, Sage Yagne Valkya 3000 BCE propounded heliocentric model. Shatapata Brahmana, he measured the distance from Earth to Sun, Earth to Moon at 108 times the diameter of the Earth and uh, Sun and Earth. Modern figures are these. Surya Siddhanta has got a lot of complex astronomical and time measurements. 2000 years ago, Indians proposed stars were like the Sun but further away. Aryabhata had something that looked like a partial heliocentric model. He knew that uh, the shadows of the Earth, shadows of the Moon because of the Sun shining on it. He also had formulas to compute the length of the shadows and if an eclipse will happen and all those kind of things. Varaha Mehra said same force that holds objects to Earth also holds celestial bodies in space. Brahmagupta calculated Earth's uh, uh, circumference at 36,000 kilometers. Bhaskara II calculated precision of equinox at 25,461 years. The same precision that I'm talking about, Bhaskara II put it down to 25,441 years. Very, very accurate figure that was not bettered upon until uh, European science around 19th century. Sayana, who was a minister in the Prime Minister in uh, Vijayanagar, he in his commentary on Rig Veda computed the speed of light. Subhash Kak shows that his 2002 or two Yojanas and half Nimisha translates to this figure, very modern figure. <coughs> Surya Siddhanta, amazing book. You can download this from Google and uh, read it. It contains chapters on astronomy, time cycles and planetary diameters. Yep, you heard me right. It talks about planetary diameters. Not only were the ancient Indians observing these planets as blobs of light moving in the sky, but they also knew those blobs of light have got a diameter, a physical dimension associated with it, and they were able to compute it. So Surya Siddhanta lists Mercury at uh, not in miles, obviously. These are modern uh, interpretations. 3,008 miles, the true figure is so much. Saturn at 73,000 miles, this is the true figure. Mars at 3,700 miles, this is the true figure. Venus and Jupiter, they made some uh, mistakes in uh, getting those things. Now you may wonder, how on earth did they do that? Whether it was 700 BCE or 480 current era, how on earth did they do that? They didn't have telescopes. How did they do that? Well, it turns out that they used trigonometric ideas. <coughs> One idea, if you have the half moon directly overhead of you, you know that the illuminated face of the moon comes 180 degrees away from the sun. You know that if this distance from you to the moon is 1, if this angle is one-seventh of a degree, then this is 400, a right angle triangle property. Using these ideas and using ideas that everybody who's done integration in high school knows about, if you did Rayman integration, you know that you had to draw a lot of lines over there in your graph paper and summing the area under the curve. You know, those lines help you to do that to get a better and better figure. Similarly, the ancient Indians, in order to compute Tithi, they needed to compute Tithi when a particular Tithi would pass and so on, as accurately as possible. So they would divide the nakshatra from one to the other by finer lines of resolution which will allow them to map the movement of heavenly bodies in a much finer way. So by making use of how quickly the bodies are moving and by using trigonometric ideas, they were able to estimate these planetary diameters.
that is the ingenuity of our ancestors that we need to connect to this is lost in the popular discourse completely we have no idea we don't even talk about these things a collection of some of our ancient uh, greats uh, brahmagupta who were studied the works of aryabhata latadeva varamira and others he wrote brahmasputra siddhanta and kandakatkaya transmitted by the arabs i'll show that later solutions of linear quadratic equations and the rules for zero operation positive negative numbers trigonometric tables and he in astronomy he said the moon is closer to the earth than the sun and he solved this equation which is a very famous equation in uh, literature more than in this time frame he had a complete solution to the set of equations which the westerners referred to as a pell's equation and even greats like uh, euler and others were clueless on how to solve this and eventually after about 100 years of trying europe was able to solve this 1000 years after uh, brahmagupta had already solved it vaskara 1 who wrote these works zero positional arithmetic approximation for sine this is a very famous approximation that sin x can be represented by this kind of uh, expression very very famous even today we use this and he's the one who do who invented that vaskara 2 lived in bijapur bijapur northern karnataka and he went to ujjain and became the head of the department of astronomy over there an instance of people moving across the country and uh, working in different places he wrote siddhanta shiromani and he appears to have also got the elements of differential calculus he computed precision like i told you the statement he made at the highest point the instantaneous speed is zero this is an assertion of the calculus of variation where at the highest point the rate of change is zero that is the property i use even today for a living in optimization and uh, fields like that so i owe it all to this very famous scientist one of my most famous uh, favorite scientists from ancient india baskara to madhava of sangama grama thrissur all these expressions that you see this infinite series are attributed to him so he is the man who invented this and much 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 more founder of kerala school of astronomy and math infinite series calculus trigonometry iterative solution of nonlinear equations something i do for a living even today uh, originated with him uh, we typically think that newton is the man who talked about iterative solution of uh, nonlinear equations but it turns out that he was the one who did these things George Joseph G Verghese professor he says that Madhava's math was transmitted to Europe a century before Newton by the church and these are some of the alumni of the school so I've come now to the uh, next part of my talk i think this is the final part the allegation that india was in the receiving end of greek and babylonian knowledge so i'd like to address a question did indian knowledge flow out of india or into india and my assertion is it is an out of india untold story before i do that I need to talk about the routes for knowledge transfer people say okay knowledge went how did it go and this is one of the routes the silk route also included india and one of the most famous works of indian medicine called the bower manuscript bower manuscript contained the bela samhita part of um, um, punarvashu atreya's uh, 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 works of charaka samhita all of those things are found in kashkar Kashgar is in the Xinjiang province and they found Bohr manuscript there somewhere in the 18th century or so that is an instance of indic knowledge finding itself on a trade route which means that indic knowledge is also on trade routes from all the way from china up to mediterranean and europe another route for knowledge transfer was the trade the periplus of erythrean sea talks in the 1st century about all these ports on western uh, coast of india and the eastern coast of india from where ships could land take goods and uh, go through red sea onto mediterranean uh, lands and so on was another route for knowledge transmission it doesn't mean it started in the 1st century it's just that this map is dated to 1st century let me go from that to uh, third route for knowledge transfer after the macedonian alexander came to the frontiers of india he left behind several indo greek uh, kingdoms and the seleucid empire was one of them that formed a buffer between the mauryans and the uh, and the greek parts and that also found formed a conduit where indic knowledge could transfer from this point and the point i'd like to show you knowledge outflows from india in every time period pre pythagoras 2000 bce to 500 bc pythagoras 500 bc post alexander buddhist hindu outflows then the muslim period abbasid delhi sultanate mughal periods as well as colonial period up to present times i'd like to show in every period of time indic knowledge 
went out of india and seeded the corpus of knowledge in the rest of the world this is a map of the world from approximately 1300 bce and uh, what you see is in africa you have a lot of uh, simple people hunter gatherers and nomadic people and so on all of siberia russia you have simple people same thing with europe you have simple cultures living there iran pastoral people uh, australia and elsewhere so only in china you have the shang civilization i don't like these words dravidian and aryan but unfortunately again is a secular source so i was forced to take this i like to call them indian civilizations existed here over here in the in greece you had the greek civilization and you had a, a little bit of activity in the sumeria and has exploded over here you see the hittites the hittites were at where today's turkey is and they are actually called the hatti people anglicization of that is hittites the hatti people are known to have a city called purushottama city of man so very indic knowledge sitting over there and uh, let me go back by one the mitannis who lived in this part of the world they were known to be a sanskritic people who invoked the vedic gods indra varuna ashwinis and so on in their peace treaties with the pharaohs in other words in the name of indra in the name of varuna i promise not to attack you those kind of peace treaties they had with the egyptian pharaohs then you had the kassites the babylonians who lived here at the tail end of this place in dilmon you see dilmon over here this is approximately the place where bahrain is where even today they found indus valley seals and other things from lothal in this place showing contact from those days itself into this part of the world so indic thought was prevalent in this area of the world this area of the world and this area of the world we should not go looking for an actual artifact or a record saying these things so to reconstruct this past we are going to look for echoes of indian thought in this very very early periods of time when we cannot physically be expected to get direct evidence that is what we are applying as a methodology over here so uh, in in another talk i talk about um, i talk about the knowledge of medical exchange uh, in my talk on um, antiquity of indian medical systems on ihr channel i explain these things in great detail and show what thought existed here 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 and here that shows reflections of ayurvedic knowledge unfortunately i can't include that also in today's talk that's uh, too detailed over here pythagoras who lived in this time frame these gentlemen who are all westerners albert burkey and uh, an marlow and g r s mead each of them says that pythagoras went to india where he learned his philosophies knowledge and other things from these are not indic people saying this these are western sources saying these things so pythagoras was a gentleman who came a suggestion that he learned in southern india and i postulated the question could that have been kanchipuram kanchipuram today we are told was a capital of the pallavas so perhaps entered the record from then but it's far more ancient than that far more ancient than the pallavas so could he have learned at uh, kanchipuram when pythagoras went back to greece he was called a madman because he had become a vegetarian they said he only ate nuts fruits corn and these kinds of things and people said he is something crazy with this guy not eating meat he also started a gurukulam style of school where he was the teacher in charge and his uh, bachelor students his closest pupils ready to get his revealed wisdom were around him and in the outer circle were the outer students on their way to coming to the inner circle this gurukulam style of teaching was inherited by his successors socrates plato as well as aristotle all of them followed the same uh, gurukulam style of teaching finally he also believed in transmigration of the soul here is a paper that talks about pythagoras the doctrine of transmigration from the royal asiatic society so he believed in reincarnation in addition so very clearly there is a strong element of indic thought in uh, pythagoras works you need to ask a question why did pythagoras even come to india how did he know that india was a source of knowledge if we go even further beyond pythagorean time frame we look at the similarities in the greek stories and the indian puranic stories there's enormous enormous overlap in these two stories hinting much more ancient contact and the contact in fact goes back to the mycenaean period the mycenaean period was a time when the greeks had contact with the with the Uh, mitannis the mitannis and other uh, populations and they learned their knowledge from the hittites and others that's where the knowledge transmissions happened <coughs> like to talk to you about kanada kanada conservatively dated to 600 bce and democritus who lived in this time frame 
Kanada was exponent of Vaisheshika Sutra. He said to understand Brahman, you should understand the natural world. He said nine classes of reality and infinity. Creation is made up of atoms. Atman pervades material. Seven classes of experience, substance, quality, activity, generality, particularity, inherence, non-existence, triads of substance, colors, taste, smell, so on. In other words, to understand the physical world, he said, well, it's a deeper philosophy. in order to understand the source of vidya and avidya that was his goal what is vidya what is avidya in the context of brahman the study of avidya is also vidya so here was his attempt at studying the physical world the, which is vidya over here democritus on this side who is called the father of modern science he is known to have traveled to asia and india and ethiopia and returned with something called natural philosophy he said creation is made up of atoms of different types that degenerate two types of knowing legitimate with intellect and illegitimate with sense objects does this sound familiar to vedanta to anybody in this audience <laughs> so so this is what he said earth is a sphere universe made up of atoms and chaos colliding to make bigger worlds very very interesting connections how democritus has internalized vedantic knowledge post alexander 330 bce we talked about seleucid empire we talked about these things in this time frame heliodorus pillar proof of krishna worship we know that uh, alexander ordered the translation of astronomical works in persia and mesopotamia for uh, for aristotle and this was transmitted to hipparchus via the library at alexandria which was set up for transmission of indic knowledge and others from the east to the west I'd like to talk about hipparchus and trigonometry Before that, Surya Siddhanta contains chord tables. Arya Bhatta composed. There should be only one T here. I apologize. This is a mistake. There's only one T. Uh, composed sine tables in 3.5 degree segments. The J and the Kojya leading to sine and cosine. Pingala and Chanda Shastra, 400 BC, worked on combinatorics and binomials. Vritti Garga, 500 BC, proposed precession of equinox. He said one degree for 100 years. The same thing that I said, 25,700 years. Vritti Garga had proposed it as 36,000 years. so very strong schools of proportional logic in jains sanskrit scholars and vedanta and this knowledge transmission route is via aristotle and alexandria hipparchus who lived between 190 and 120 bce worked on chord tables in 7.5 degree segments he proposed the same rate of precession as vritti garga 36000 years plutarch shows that hipparchus was able to do something called enumerative combinatorics which pingala had already done a long time ago same thing as pingala's work this propositional logic is in stoicism stoicism is an offshoot of plato which is rooted in thoughts of vedanta brahman and so on so once again you see echoes of indic thought in hipparchus and the western position is that hipparchus thought his astronomy sorry trigonometry to indians so aryabhatta learned his trigonometry from the works of uh, hipparchus that is the statement ptolemy is also supposed to be one of the sources for aryabhatta's work and in this book by uh, uh, robert newton he says that every observation of ptolemy was allegedly fabricated he alleges that ptolemy was a liar and a plagiarist and he suggests that the trigonometric tables calculated by uh, him were actually done by eratosthenes in this time frame in egypt so we need to understand who is eratosthenes Eratosthenes is this person who is a mathematician, astronomer, geographer, poet, music theorist and his day job was he was a chief librarian at Alexandria. <laughs> he had a lot of time on his hands to read manuscripts from India and learn a lot about what's going on. So a uh, library at Alexandria, well before that, he worked on circumference of the earth, tilt of earth's axis, distance from earth to sun as a measure of the diameter of the sun or diameter of earth same thing which yagnavalkya had done in 3000 bce same things he worked on stoicism of plato this library was destroyed with julius caesar 40 bce then by the pope when uh, uh, europe became christian in uh, 341 current era to uh, stamp out all of pagan works uh, destroyed with the muslims 690 current era and this library essentially facilitated sourcing knowledge from the east and transmitting it to the west from that i'd like to move on to the abbasid empire so the abbasid era is from 700 to the year 1000 so they ruled a great empire all the way from sindh <coughs> through the northern part of africa arabia and so on up to spain <coughs> excuse me 
So in Spain, you had uh, Muslim Spain and you had Christian Spain. That is the division of Spain in that time. Al-Fazari is known to have translated Brahmagupta's Brahmasputta Siddhanta and Kanda Kand- Katkaya to Arabic, which was brought by pa- pandits from Sindh to Baghdad. They called it Sindh Hind and Arakant. Manka or Kanka, an uh, Indian physician in the court of Harun al-Rashid, he translated Shushruta Samhita to Persian, used by Avicenna. His medical texts were the foundation of European medicine. Abid Allah bin Ali, he translated Charaka Samhita to Arabic and Persian and this was transmitted from Baghdad all the way up to Spain. Al-Kindi was a very famous Arabic uh, uh, scientist and he translated Greek and Indian works and wrote many works on math, medicine, astronomy, chemistry, music and philosophy. (coughs) We know that in this time frame, 1000 to 1700, enormous transfers of scientific works, math, medicine, astronomy, chemistry, toxicology were done. We know what Al-Baruni, Al-Baruni accompanied Ghazni. He came with a recommendation letter from the Sultan of uh, Baghdad, who identified him as a scholar and told Ghazni, when you're going to Hindustan to raid over there, please take him along because he is a scholar. He'll copy down the textbooks and all those kind of things. So he knew Persian, Arabic. He learned Sanskrit in India. He knew Greek and Hebrew. He was an enviable position of having read the Greek works and encountered Indian works. So he was able to do comparative analysis on these things too. He wrote Kitab Tariq al-Hind, translated many works, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Panchatantra. Then this uh, Sultan Firoz ibn Tughlaq is known to have plundered Nagar Kot and acquired a library of 1,300 books in Sanskrit, translated to Persian. Zain ul Abidin from Kashmir had a bilateral translation department. Not only did he translate Sanskrit to Persian, but he also translated Persian to Sanskrit. For the first time in Indic thought, you have evidence of outside knowledge coming into India over here. There is no other record in any other period of time where knowledge came from outside India to here. It was here in this time frame where he had bilateral translation, some works came in. Akbar had did the same. <coughs> Darashiko, the unfortunate brother of Aurangzeb, he had Persian translations of Upanishads, 50 works. The Europeans got their taste of the Upanishads after Plato and other works through Darashiko's translations. I'd like to talk to you about transmission of this information to medieval Europe. In Toledo, if you remember, I said there was Christian Spain and Muslim Spain. Christian Spain, as a Muslim Spain, Cordoba was the capital in the Christian side, Toledo. At Toledo, there was a monastery whose only job was to translate texts from uh, Arabic into Latin. So, uh, Gerard of Cremona is a name that has come to us from the past. He translated 87 Arabic works from Latin, math, astronomy and medicine. And Constantine the African, he is a Christian monk in Italy who translated Arabic medical works. Here I've shown a small graphic. This graphic shows Indic knowledge that first went to the Greeks and Romans. Most of it was destroyed in, uh, in the Byzantine kingdom by the uh, uh, Christian uh, rulers who did not want pagan knowledge to exist over there. So it died out over there. However, some of that knowledge existed in Islamic lands, Arabic lands, before they became Islam also, in Lebanon, Syria, and all these kind of places. Muslims inherited these works along with knowledge that was destructively obtained from India, and they were consolidators. They consolidated all of this information and was injected into Europe, into Latin, by this translation school that I talked about. Also, there were travelers in every period of time, including colonial people, who directly took Indic knowledge to Europe. And all of this knowledge today has come back to us, bereft of any citations and repackaged with, obviously, much more refined knowledge systems and so on. Unfortunately, we have lost track of where did this knowledge come from, and we are left in awe of the Western civilization, which have, could have built such an enormous edifice of knowledge, without acknowledging that they stood on the shoulders of your ancestors to understand how to take it from there to the next point on. Here are some examples of transmission of knowledge in 1200s to 1300s. Marco Polo, Jordanus Catalani, several of these people. This book you can download in Google that uh, shows you some of the Indic knowledge in this period of time. 1400s Europeans, Niccolo da Conti, very famous because he visited Vijayanagar and formed eyewitness accounts to uh, how Vijayanagar was in that period of time. His works are very influential in 15th century cartography. Uh, Alfonsi Nikhtin of Russia, Vasco da Gama, all these are visitors. This book over here, India in the 15th century, talks about voyages to India, knowledge transmissions. 
1500s, the Portuguese had come veritably with armies, 13 ships, 1500 men and so on. There were several visitors, some of them not visitors, conquerors and such things. Some of them, for example, were Portuguese scientists, Pedro Nunes, uh, this is a De Castro, who was the fourth viceroy to India. So these are scientists also who came to India and studied Indian works, translated them and took it back with them. This frieze or statues in uh, Lisbon shows these prominent people of the Portuguese society who are looking outward to the ocean because that's where they got their knowledge from, from India. So this monument that is there in Lisbon, I think, uh, Sahana, you took this picture when you went over there. It shows, uh, uh, shows this fact even today. Now, when, uh, when, when Europe finally got its act together, got the uh, knights and the soldiers and Pope's blessings and everything, they finally went and reconquered Spain. They went through a period of inquisition when they were stamping out the Moorish influence, the Muslim influence in Spain. At that time, any Muslim knowledge was seen as seeking knowledge from Satan, inviting savage retribution. Until that period of time, the nobility of Europe would send their eldest sons to Muslim Spain to learn at the feet of the Moors, because they said Moors have got better knowledge than us, so they would go there and learn. But from then on, it was an Inquisition period. So Renaissance European scholars hid their sources and passed off Greek and Indic works as original knowledge. All of a sudden, you had people coming out of dark ages and disease and illiteracy and the oppression of the church, coming out and saying, I invented this, I invented that, and so on. And we barely questioned the veracity of these claims. However, this is, the, this is what was going on over there. So European works in astronomy, math, medicine was greatly predated by Indian and Greek works. However, they ignored citation to Indian sources, therefore I call them plagiarizing. In colonial period, you had a gold rush literally by every colonial occupier. Missionaries were at the head of uh, leading and uh, collecting and translation, the Dutch and Tranquebar. Bartholomew Ziegenbach, for example, I picked up this book in French Institute of Pondicherry. It is just a book on the number of books copied by this gentleman, uh, Ziegenbach. Just a bibliography, a 200-page bibliography of all the books he collected. Portuguese in Goa, Francis Xavier, French in Tamil Nadu collected enormous numbers of work. They have the greatest collection of Shaiva Siddhanta manuals under their control now, which they took when they arrived in uh, rather um, conquered Tamil Nadu. The British collected works all over India, and uh, we have information of that too. So with that, I know I've taken a long time in this talk, but this is my closing remarks over here. I hope I have established evidence for an untold story of ancient India. I hope I've shown you that there was no Aryan invasion or migration of or to India. Indian civilization has cultural memory going back to 24,000 years. Indians produced knowledge in many fields. Enormous knowledge transfers out of India in every time period. We have examined the evidence from genetics, astronomy, archaeology, literary sources, as well as knowledge transfers to uh, come to our conclusions. Thank you very much. You have been a very patient audience. Thank you. Thank you.